Hello, everyone, and welcome to our live Q&A session with local dementia experts. My name is Herman Chique Alfonso, and I'm the Education Coordinator for the Dementia Society of Ottawa and Renfrew County. So, during January 2023, through the Alzheimer's Awareness Month, the Dementia Society has been raising awareness about dementia support, diagnosis, prevention, risk factors, and dementia inclusiveness. So today, we're very lucky to have a panel of dementia experts that will address some of your questions about living with dementia after a diagnosis, dementia care, and support in our community. So without further ado, I will turn over to Grace. Hi, everybody. Good evening. Uh, my name is Grace. I'm a volunteer with the Dementia Society. If you've attended any of our Dementia Basics sessions, you may be familiar with me, um, but I will be moderating tonight's session. I'm, I'm very happy to be with everybody tonight. Um, and just before we get started, going to quickly review a few housekeeping items so that we can move through tonight's event as smoothly as possible since we're all joining virtually. Um, so just a few things to keep in mind. First of all, the session is being recorded. Uh, the purpose of recording is so that we can share it out afterwards. Um, if you have to miss part of the session, you can always catch up afterwards. We'll be sharing it out on our YouTube channel. Um, and that's just something to keep in mind when you are sharing, of course, any personal information with others on the call. Um, some of our calls are confidential and that's just not the case for this one. Um, if you have any questions as we move throughout the panel, uh, you can feel free to go ahead and enter them in the chat box or the Q&A box. So if you look on the bottom menu of your Zoom platform, you should see a little chat bubble. Um, I find it's easiest just to type them in there, uh, and then we can go ahead and read out a few questions at the end if time permits. We might have time for up to five questions at the end. Um, we will, however, be prioritizing questions that have been submitted in advance. So um, a huge thank you to everybody that went ahead and submitted a question for this panel. Um, it's much appreciated. And we will be moving through a couple rounds of questions with our panelists this evening uh, to get those answered. And um, as I mentioned, there are a couple features of Zoom that might help out uh, with tonight's session. There is closed, cap closed captioning available um, if you would like to have that available to you. It's also on the bottom menu of your Zoom screen. You'll see a little icon with CC on it and it says show captions. If you click on that, um, you should be able to see closed captioning for the event, which is wonderful. Uh, so with that, we can start off with some introductions to our wonderful panelists tonight. Um, I am going to start by handing it off to Dr. Andrew Frank. Uh, Dr. Frank, if you don't mind kicking us off with an introduction to yourself and how you're involved in dementia care. Thank you, Grace. Uh, good evening, everybody. I apologize. Um, I'm in a location where I don't have access to webcam. Um, but I'm on the call looking forward to the session. I'm a cognitive neurologist, a physician at the Briere Memory Program in Ottawa downtown, and my practice is dedicated to early detection of dementia and Alzheimer's disease, uh, differentiating that from uh, memory changes from aging, as well as research into new medications for Alzheimer's disease uh, and new technologies. Wonderful. Um, I'm going to hand it off to Kevin. Hi, everyone. My name is Kevin Bablick. I'm Director of Home and Community Care Support Services. We have a brand new name that we change quite often to keep everybody guessing. Um, so we are the people that uh, work with system navigation, trying to help people find their way and access the services they need. And indeed, um, of link to available other resources as well and the providers of home care. Personally, um, my background, I've worked in every aspect of the system and healthcare. I've worked in the hospital system and complex continuing care. A lot of my interaction currently is with long-term care. Um, and indeed, I have even worked in private practice in the past. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful. Um, up next, I'll hand it to Misha. Good evening, my name is Misha McCallum. I am the team lead of the Dementia Care Coach team uh, who provide 
caregiver support, uh, family direction, system navigation, and really try to be the go-to people for what to do next or answering some strategy questions on how to support someone living with dementia. And uh, so my background is in social services and I've worked in long-term care, retirement and adult day programs. So, uh, um, and I've been with the Dementia Society for almost nine years now. Thank you. And go ahead, Jane. Okay, my name is Jane Kipfer and I'm the specialist in spirituality and aging with the Schlegel University Waterloo Research Institute for Aging. So I teach spirituality and aging at the University of Waterloo and do research. And I also spend part of each week as a spiritual life facilitator in a retirement home community. So I have lots of friends who are on the dementia journey, some adjusting to early changes and others further along. So with lots of conversations. Today I led a time of singing, also facilitate peer support groups for care partners. Wonderful, thank you all for the introductions. Um, we're happy to have such a diverse group of panelists with us tonight, uh, hopefully providing different perspectives on the questions that have been submitted. Um, in terms of the format for tonight's session, we have a few rounds of questions. So the way that we're going to move through it um, is I will start with uh, Dr. Frank as our first panelist and then move through the four panelists, each with a separate question in each round. Um, as I mentioned before, if you have additional questions come up as we're going through this, feel free to submit them in the chat. If we don't have a chance to get to them in tonight's event, uh, you can always reach out separately to the Dementia Society and we will uh, do our best to direct your question to an expert in that way. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started with our first round of questions. Uh, and Dr. Frank, uh, we had someone submit a question around omega-3. So they're wondering if omega-3 is helpful in preventing or slowing the progression of dementia. Uh, thank you, Grace. Uh, let me just check once again. Can you hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you. That's excellent. Uh, and it's, it's an excellent question as well. Thank you for submitting that. Um, Omega-3s, um, omega-6, omega-9, they are fatty acids, so they're components of fats, which we take in as part of our diet. As you know, for example, they are a component of uh, oily fish, for example, uh, and they are broken down in our body and then basically incorporated into the brain as the brain rebuilds itself to um, fix uh, brain cells to actually allow brain cells to grow and make new connections, they require fatty acids like this to uh, build and grow. So it makes sense that a, a food like that or a supplement like that should help the brain uh, resist aging and maybe even resist Alzheimer's and dementia. So research has been done in this area to try to answer this question. And there are different levels of evidence when it comes to determining if it's helpful. For example, you can look to see if individuals who do have dementia or don't have dementia and see, did one group eat more omega-3 omega fatty acids than the other? And some evidence seemed to show that yes, those who ate more fish, for example, omega-3 fatty acids, or uh, who took supplements um, seem to have less Alzheimer's disease. The problem with that evidence is that even though there's an association between consuming omega-3s and less dementia, that doesn't mean that the omega-3s are causing the less dementia. That is, having an association between two things like omega-3s and dementia or less dementia, um, having an association does not mean that one caused the other. So to really understand that, you actually have to do a kind of trial where you give half of the people in the trial omega-3s and half of the people a placebo that looks like omega-3s and then without telling them exactly what they got and then measuring over time if there's a difference in the dementia over time. That's the kind of evidence really that can test if 
taking or if eating more omega threes uh, or taking an omega three supplement is actually beneficial. And when such trials were done with the omega threes and placebo, the results were very mixed. They didn't recruit that many people, and some of the trials like that showed a benefit to memory, and some showed no benefit at all, and no change in the rate of dementia at all. So we're left with a situation where it makes sense to eat this kind of food, this, this substance, um, but, and there's an association between less dementia and omega-3, but when the trials are done with an actual supplement versus placebo, the results are not clear at all. So where do I, what do I feel about this? I feel that consuming omega-3s as part of a balanced diet, which includes oily fish, as part of what's known as the Mediterranean diet, which has also been researched. And again, there's association level data that it's beneficial to the heart and brain. So the Mediterranean diet with fish, I recommend that. But do I recommend a supplement with purified omega-3, 6, 9 fatty acids? For the reasons I've described, I do not clearly recommend a supplement. But incorporating fish, oily fish, into a Mediterranean diet, I feel is rational and even recommended. Okay, that's wonderful insight. Thanks. I know we are frequently asked the question around the Mediterranean diet, so that's that's a great distinction to make between that and the actual supplement form. Thanks, Dr. Frank. Okay, so moving on with a question for Misha around dementia care. Um, this is a situational question. So they've asked, my wife has dementia and needs 24-7 care. I need help looking after her. What resources are available to us in home care? Are there programs she can attend for a couple hours during the day as an alternative? Yeah, so that's a question we get quite frequently uh, when we support caregivers and families um, over the phone and in person. And uh, a lot of the times we try to tease out and find out what type of care the person needs. So sometimes it's it's respite support that's needed for the caregiver. So just like this person mentioned, a few hours a day so that they can maybe get some things done or have a break for themselves. Uh, sometimes it's having a companion, someone else they can socialize with. Sometimes it's physical care that they need. And um, so often our first question we ask them once we find out more details on the situation is, um, have they connected with home and community care? Um, and so I'll, I'll ask Kevin to step in in a few moments because at that point we'll, we'll send a referral to home and community care or, or show the caregiver how they can connect themselves. Uh, both options um, are the same. And so we'll, we'll figure out what's best for the family. And then from there, uh, the assessment is done by a care coordinator to figure out what services they need to be linked to. So Kevin, if you'd like to add to that question. Um, by all means, I don't know if that's a blend into my question, and then you wouldn't mind if I popped it back to you, Misha. Would that be okay, Grace? Of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. It, so it does really lead to the question that I had listed, and and I think I might give the follow up part back to Misha. <laughs> we can we can absolutely do that. So the question for Kevin was, how do I get help with everything related to dementia, um, as in care, long term home support, and finances? Um, so yeah, leapfrogging off the Misha's question, that one goes into it well. We are the organization or we have care coordinate that does coordinate home care, um, as well as access to a number of services, notably long-term care, um, adult day programs, um, assisted living, as well as links with what are called the community support services, which are community agencies that provide a lot of those essentials that might not be the direct care ones, but they are the pe they are the people that will um, look after transportation, look after um, meals on wheels, look after friendly visitors and things like that. So I, I will say the easiest way to access us for Misha is really easy. There is one number, it's 310-2222. Uh, you don't even need a 613 in front of it, I believe. 
but you can go through your doctor's office, a friend can call, family members can call, others can. We of course do have to check for consent with the individual um, who would be receiving the care. But so even where there's a POA, we do have to check with that person. It's not always um, active, but uh, understanding the support. And indeed, no door is the wrong door. We would have a care coordinator to go out, set up home care resources with you. They'd assess your needs. They may be home care. And again, they may just be system navigation. I think Misha noted people call with one question. We often get people calling to access long-term care. And indeed, what they need is perhaps some support in home. They do need, as noted in the question, access to the adult day programs and things like that. So our organization doesn't deal directly only with dementia, but that is one of the aspects and it's very much one of the more frequent ones. We do have professional services and as well as um, other services that will help coordinate in, with you. As far as support for finances and other pieces, we do have some elder mediation support that helps people set up a network, but indeed this is where your dementia navigator and, and the people from the Dementia Society can really set up links. And uh, Misha, I might turn it back over to you with some of those additional supports outside of home care and links to community agencies. Of course, so we, uh, we have a wonderful fact sheet that we've put together that links to um, various uh, subsidies and um, different government um, options that um, that offer tax credits and and it depends on the situation the income level and and what someone really requires or wants um, financially we also have a learning session where we have um, an expert in finances that you can attend or you can go to our YouTube page and watch the recording too. And um, there's been lots of great questions um, over the years that that have pre and post COVID because sometimes situations change and, and what's available out there is, is different as well. Um, and then as a dementia care coach, um, there's various other community resources that might be helpful to to the client. So, so we really try to figure out what the goal is uh, from the client and, and try to create a checklist um, and make sure that we complete certain goals before we go on to the next one. Um, and so whether it is finances or it's it's other community resources, you really try to figure out what's most important to the to the family and the person living with dementia. Wonderful, thanks. Um, and just some of those references that you mentioned, like the fact sheet, just so everybody on the call is aware, uh, all the references mentioned in this event will be sent out uh, in an email afterwards. So if you're wondering where you can find those, um, you can look out in your email for uh, just kind of a wrap up email about the event. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, Misha and Kevin. Uh, so now kind of shifting to some of the self-care aspects of dealing with dementia or being a caretaker um, in, in a situation where somebody has been diagnosed with dementia is a question for Jane. Um, so somebody is wondering, my husband has been diagnosed with dementia. How can I take care of myself and improve my faith during uncertain times? What advice would you have for them? Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that question. It's a big one. And uh, it's good coming from the perspective of the care partner. How can I take care of myself? I'd say relax as best you can. Let your expectations shift rather than, than fight what you can't control and find the freedom to do what works. Relaxing expectations for, for your husband and for yourself, being compassionate with your and his emotions. There's a lot of feelings that come with these changes, disappointment, frustrations. There's also still joy and peace and, and love as part of life. I encourage you to keep variety and balance in your lives. What's good for your body is often good for your spirit too. So enjoy healthy food, as we've already heard, refreshing exercise, connections with friends, those connections are really important. As you relate to your husband in, in ways that are loving and respectful and adapt to his, his new needs, your friends and your family will learn how to continue to include him and you in their lives as well. Those connections are important for him and for you. Your spiritual life is important. 
And it isn't a separate category of life, but it can permeate all of your everyday life. Simple practices like breathing, breathing deeply and intentionally, breathing in love, breathing in patience, or whatever it is you need, and breathing back into the world, what you hope there will be more of, breathing out peace, beauty. Prayers can be very simple in these times. It's about understanding yourself as connected to all that is. People, plants, animals, the divine. Those relationships remind you that you're not alone. Everything has its seasons. You can trust that you're all right. Make your caregiving nurturing for yourself as well as for your partner whenever you can. If you're making him a cup of tea, make one for you too and sit and enjoy together. Shift perspective and see what you can enjoy, like a walk in nature, some meaningful music from the past. Expect to learn new things every day and let that energize you. Be humble and curious about what you don't know. And there's lots of room for that in the world of dementia. And sometimes there's room for lament as well. And the Beatitudes we read, those who mourn will experience comfort. We don't need to be afraid of our hard emotions. Be honest with our feelings. Being sad doesn't mean that you'll get stuck in sadness. So let yourself and your husband feel all the feelings that you need to feel. And be assured that love will be there, even through loss. And know that as a person of faith, you can trust that you'll be carried through this. You'll be given what you need to live each moment. Lean on God for strength, for courage, for a safe place, for honesty and understanding. And hopefully there'll be people in your, in your faith community who will be supportive as well. So try to conserve your energy for living and for loving rather than worry or negativity. Relax, enjoy the small things, keep connected, and keep your sense of humor. Thank you so much, Jane. I think we can all take something away from that. Absolutely. Um, okay, so moving on to round two, I'm going to hand it back to Dr. Frank for this question uh, around vascular dementia. So uh, somebody submitted a question wondering, is vascular dementia likely to progress into Alzheimer's disease? Uh, Dr. Frank, if you can lend any insight there. Uh, thank you. Another excellent question. Uh, let me explain. The word uh, dementia means, the, de the word dementia alone means a memory or thinking change which takes away some independence. It's a general term for anything that can cause memory or thinking change and uh, loss of independence. There are different causes of dementia. The most common cause of dementia is Alzheimer's disease, which is a buildup of a protein in the brain, the Alzheimer's proteins actually, that cause dementia. Now, the second or maybe third, let's say the second or third most common cause of dementia is stroke. A stroke is where the blood in the brain gets blocked or there's bleeding in the brain both of which disrupt the blood flow and therefore the oxygen that the brain needs. So if there is a stroke and part of the brain is damaged, especially the memory or thinking areas, you can develop a dementia as a result of the stroke. And that is known as vascular dementia. Vascular means blood flow. Now, if it's true that the stroke has occurred and there are no other strokes which take place. And we try to prevent more strokes by watching blood pressure and cholesterol, diabetes. We try to stop smoking. We try to have a healthy lifestyle, all to prevent more strokes and more or more heart attacks. If there are no more strokes, then there will be no further deterioration of the brain, meaning 
that the vascular dementia, which has taken place as a result of the single stroke and the memory change and the thinking change and the loss of independence that took place as a result of the single stroke, that should remain quite stable because there are no further strokes taking place. In fact, after a stroke, sometimes there can be recovery from the stroke and the memory and thinking change might actually slowly improve over the next six months, 12 months, even a couple of years. Even rehabilitation can be helpful after a stroke that can help memory and thinking and functioning. So if there's no further stroke that take place, then the dementia, if you will, should remain quite stable or possibly improve. And we want to do everything we can to prevent further stroke. Now, it is possible to have two conditions at the same time, both the stroke and Alzheimer's as well. It's possible for the brain to have a stroke and a buildup of those toxic proteins of Alzheimer's. If there are no Alzheimer's uh, proteins building up, then vascular dementia should remain stable or improve. However, if there are two conditions happening at the same time, both the stroke and the Alzheimer's proteins, then over time, yes, the memory loss could gradually deteriorate. And we call that a mixed dementia meaning that is a mixture of the stroke and the Alzheimer's proteins at the same time. Uh, and that is known as mixed dementia. And that is why at our clinic, if someone has had a stroke and has been diagnosed with vascular dementia, we may schedule a follow-up in the year to test the memory again, to see if there is stability, which we hope for, or if there is gradual deterioration, which may mean that there's that second condition, Alzheimer's disease, creating a mixed dementia, which yes, can gradually deteriorate. Okay, understood. Yeah, so maybe the term mixed dementia is something for people to, to write down if they're interested in uh, doing a little more research there. Thanks, Dr. Frank. Uh, so moving on to Misha, who's adorable dog I see in the background or saw in the background a few minutes ago. Um, so this is another situational question that's been submitted. I have read that it's best not to argue with my mother, who is 87, but her delusions are frightening her. For example, she is, she is not at home confusing TV scenarios with reality. What do you think is the best approach? So... This goes for anything, if someone is experiencing delusions or not. We want to try as best as we can to connect versus correct. So we want to walk into that person's reality and what they're experiencing is very real to them. So it may not connect with our reality and what they experienced before they were living with dementia, but we need to walk alongside them, walk with them and validate how they're feeling. Because a lot of the times what they need is reassurance to know that what they're feeling is going to be okay, or that you are with them and that they will be fixing whatever is upsetting them too. So um, we talk about having certain strategies in your back pocket or, um, having a bag of tricks and certain phrases. And it takes some trial and error to figure out what that might be for your family member. And um, when something works, you can use it again in another situation. If a person is experiencing delusions, we certainly recommend they make sure that their doctor is aware so that if there's anything um, medication-wise or medically that needs to be supported. Um, and certainly if delusions come on very quickly, um, you need to see your doctor. However, um, a call with a dementia care coach, if this is an ongoing challenge, can help. You can, we can help figure out what those strategies can be so we can build up your bag of tricks um, and then as well figure out what the person likes and can get distracted by. So it's positive distractions that we're introducing into their situation that can help um, 
redirect um, whatever is going on in in their mind. So um, we never want to say that's not that's not happening. That's not real because for them it is very real. And um, so a lot of the times, what you can do is just uh, try to refocus on something positive. Yeah, absolutely. I think that connect versus correct piece is applicable in so many situations when, when people are dealing with dementia. So it's very helpful. Um, Kevin, the next question that's been submitted is um, another situational question. So they said, my wife has been diagnosed with early dementia. In time, it will be obvious that she will need constant care. How can we determine that it is time for her to be in a care facility? Um. Yeah, this is a very, it's a great question because it's a very individual question and it really depends on the resources available and how the support system is working together. Indeed, some people never need institutional care, but um, when care needs are increasing, I mean, the best thing for us is if you're involved with some of the supports in the system in, in the home care setting, that if you can involve it within then, then you will have a person, a home care, a care coordinator who should be navigating towards available community supports because for people to be eligible for long-term care, um, the basic part from the ministry is really, really generic. Um, you need to need nursing care for 24 hours, sometimes frequently within that care. A lot of people do, they're well-maintained in the community. You need to have uh, a valid OHIP card. Um, you can and be above 18. Uh, there would be a care corner that would be assess eligibility, but basically it's that individual when you feel that care needs are increasing um, beyond which the patient or the caregiver um, can accept and you're willing to accept a bed in, in long-term care. Some people want to apply just in case. Um, that just in case is not applicable. I mean, if you have care needs and you qualify, you can only apply to a stage at which you would be willing to accept a bed. That being said, there's really different wait times, one home versus another. So um, it would be important to have the discussion if you're indeed linked to community supports in advance and have a care coordinator. They may suggest it even sometimes if you don't think you're quite ready, because indeed consent, again, for every step in someone's journey is explicit. And with a competent patient, or their caregiver, they have to be ready when they apply for long-term care to have that person take their next step in the journey. And again, some of the waits can be long, especially if it's really home specific. There are homes you can get into within a couple of weeks. There are homes you may be waiting years to get into. So choice is also explicit within it, notably from the community, and you can pick a number. But that's one piece that the basic answer to the question is, um, I, I think it's important for everybody to be linked with care coordination as you're moving forward within your journey. Uh, there may be no needs at a certain point, but you can always check out, you can always reach out again. But if you're at the point when you're when the care is increasing beyond what the patient or the caregiver um, can can tolerate when their supports before that point, we would like you to reach out to us and consider it and look at your options. Because even if it's not long-term care, there may be other options available that we can navigate you to. Um, again, the province is really generic in its things. You need frequent nursing care um, and you need to be above 18 and you need an OHEP card. But beyond that, there is an eligibility determination that a care coordinator can help walk you through. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great area to, to reach out and ask for advice in uh, rather than making any assumptions and trying to do it all on your own. So that's great advice. Um, okay, so stepping back into spirituality uh, and self-care. Jane, wondering if you can please address the importance of spiritual care in the life of somebody who has been diagnosed with dementia. Uh, in particular, is there a way to more seriously address the spiritual needs of residents upon entry at long-term care homes? Sure. Thanks, Grace, for that question. We all know that we're all more than bodies and, and we're more than our minds and our cognition as well. There's a saying, that even when our bodies waste away, our spirits are renewed day by day. So in the midst of the changes of dementia, there is more that makes us human. Some even say that those who are living with dementia can be our teachers spiritually. It can teach us to slow down 
And many of us need to do that, to be in the moment, to think about what matters. I have a list here of spiritual needs that all of us as human beings have. Spiritual needs include to give and receive love, to be understood, to be valued as a human being, for forgiveness, hope, and trust, to explore beliefs and values and be able to express our faith and belief, to express feelings honestly, and to find meaning and purpose in life. And from that list, you can, can see that many, if not most of these uh, apply, even in, when we're living with dementia. But in my experience, there's just so much richness in time spent in spiritual care with those living with dementia. As a spiritual care provider myself, I'm a strong advocate for there being adequate spiritual care provision in every long-term care home. It makes such a difference. Singing together, tapping into memories and feelings. Hymns are often deep memories for many and prayers that people have memorized as a child. And to have those memories triggered and be able to participate together is such a life-giving thing. Songs touch emotion and connect people with life. And tangible objects too, living things like flowers, leaves, nature, animals. Our spirits are nurtured through focus on and connection to these things, truly taking time to enjoy them together. And food too, it can be a, a spiritual, tangible object. Or if you can't get outdoors to experience nature closely, beautiful pictures can also be really powerful. Spiritual caregivers are there to listen, and to get to know a person, who they are, who they have been throughout their life, to take time to really listen and understand, and to come alongside, value and respect and support them. Connecting them to their religious traditions and to simple spiritual practices is also part of that. Sometimes it's simply being present to emotions and ensuring that they feel loved and secure. And this kind of befriending from the chaplain and from other team members as they adjust to a new place of living is spiritual care. And yes, it's really important. Thank you, Jane, again. Um, yeah, I don't, there's something so reassuring about, you know, how it, it, it can be as easy as going to get connected with your community for those who can, you know, get out of the house and do that. But even um, individually, there's so many ways that you can connect with spirituality, even, yeah, like you mentioned, looking at pictures and listening to music and just connecting to your own emotions. So there's something really nice and, and reassuring about that, I think. Um, okay, wonderful. So we are heading into our third round of questions. Um, and again, I'm going to start off with Dr. Frank. So there's a question here about the link between Parkinson's disease and dementia. Uh, specifically, the question asks, what does dementia caused by Parkinson's look like and how progressive is it? Thank you for that question. Um, I guess it comes back to my earlier uh, description or definition of dementia. Uh, again, dementia is a change or loss of memory or thinking, which is enough to take away daily independence. That's dementia. Uh, which can be caused by Alzheimer's disease, can be caused by stroke, which is vascular. And yes, it can even be caused by Parkinson's. Now, Parkinson's is a buildup of a different protein. Alzheimer's is a buildup of a certain protein, call it the Alzheimer's protein. And Parkinson's is also a buildup of a protein, call it the Parkinson's protein. There are different proteins, those two conditions, and that's really what defines them as different. The Parkinson's protein classically, not always, but classically causes movement problems first. As we are familiar with the Parkinson's protein, as it builds up, causes someone to become stiff, maybe stooped in their posture uh, with a slowness of walking and balance um, gradually over time, often with a tremor or shaking of the hands. That is the classic uh, appearance of Parkinson's affecting uh, movement. Now, it is possible for that same Parkinson's protein to not build up in the movement area. And that same Parkinson's protein can just build up in the memory parts of the brain. 
And it is possible for the Parkinson protein to build up in both areas of the brain, the movement area and the thinking area. It's possible for the movement part to be affected first and the memory part affected second. It is possible for the memory part to be affected first and the movement part second. And it's possible for both areas to be affected by the Parkinson's protein buildup at the same time. So if all of three of those possibility in, or in terms of the order of symptoms can occur. And at our office, again, we've seen all three uh, scenarios. I don't know exactly what determines which area of the brain gets affected first by the protein. There are certainly so many questions that we haven't found answers to, but any three of those scenarios can occur. And when the memory is affected by the Parkinson's protein enough to take away daily independence, we call it Parkinson's disease dementia. Now you may read about another condition, which is called dementia with Lewy bodies, L-E-W-Y, L-E-W-Y bodies. That term is essentially the identical scenario as Parkinson's disease dementia. And the only reason it has two different names, it's the same protein for both of them. The only reason it has two different names is that initially uh, those who got the memory symptoms first were called dementia with Lewy bodies. And those who got the Parkinson's or movement, the movement symptoms first, they were called Parkinson's disease dementia. But as we've come to realize over time, these two terms, Parkinson's disease dementia and Lewy body, dementia with Lewy bodies, uh, are very likely the same condition, just affecting the two different areas of the brain uh, at um, one before the other. Oh, that's fascinating. I know we've gotten questions before about Lewy body, so that's a really interesting link to make. Thanks, Dr. Frank. Um, so handing it over to Misha, there's a question here about eating with dementia and caring for someone who maybe is refusing to eat. Uh, they've asked how to make someone living with dementia eat when they say they are hungry but refuse to eat. What would your advice be there? Yeah, so a lot of a lot of these questions are are so personal to to what the person's routine was before, what they like, what um, what brings them joy. Because we try to make meal time as enjoyable and sometimes fun. Um, we enjoy meals uh, in a lot of cultures with each other. So I think eating with the person who is living with dementia is is one of the key factors because. Um, Nobody likes to sit there and be watched while they're eating. Um, and sometimes that's the, that's the case. You're expecting somebody else to eat um, with or in front of you rather than with you. Um, you wanna make sure that the plate that they're eating on, whatever you're serving the food, um, is a different color than whatever the food is. Because sometimes the way that we, we visualize when we're living with dementia, uh, it changes and you can't necessarily differentiate between food um, and the plate if it is a very similar color. So you want that contrast to be there. Um, and if we're thinking fun, I've had uh, caregivers that I've spoken with, if the person enjoys drinking more than they do eating, um, you can look at things like smoothies and you can present it in really fun glasses. Sometimes I have a caregiver that will give their, um, their spouse uh, a glass, but it has a little umbrella on it, or it's got a really beautiful straw that's uh, served each time. So sometimes thinking about it a little more creatively like that um, can help because we want to associate meal time with a positive emotional reaction because anything that's connected to a not so positive emotional reaction might have some pushback the next time that you engage in that activity. So it doesn't mean that it's it's impossible to go back or that you've ruined a situation. You just want to try to build more positive experiences the next time you go through it. And we always say that food is better than no food. And so we don't want the person to go hungry. And sometimes the more appealing things might be more sugary or they might be a little bit saltier because our taste buds do change as we age, but then also as, as the dementia progresses as well. So um, it can be helpful to make sure that whatever you're providing the person is something that they've always eaten or something that they, they have always liked, um, looks appealing, 
and, and is something that they enjoy. So um, I've had a few cases where dessert is served before, um, before the actual main meal and that gets the person eating and that's okay. So you just work with what you've got, you trial and error, like I said before. Um, and uh, if none of that works, just kind of as a standard generic answer, then connect with one of us and we can try to tease out what, uh, what else we can, we can do to help the situation move along. Yeah, that's great. I love that piece of advice about contrast on the plate. It's so interesting. Uh, okay, wonderful. So Kevin, we have a question here about uh, the long-term care process. And I know you had touched on this in, in one of your previous answers, um, but this person is looking for some uh, more details pertaining to eligibility, uh, waiting list and requirements for a person living with dementia to be accepted into long-term care in Ottawa. Okay, well, um, long-term care is a complex process. So just as my previous answer, um, care coordinators can help with that. Um, they are obligated, indeed, uh, they have the legislative obligated uh, um, obligation to counsel people on the process. And the process is complex, so don't feel bad if, if it seems that way. The quote I made previously, and I've made it before, is long-term care is regulated, perhaps second to nuclear power. Um, there, it is not an easy process and you do need somebody to help you with it. Um, the person tasked with that is the care coordinator. Again, anybody can call us, we will have to do that. But for most people, the first step is uh, the process is referral. I mean, referral to us, you can call from anywhere. It can be your care coordinator. If you're already receiving our services, then indeed it, you can just have a discussion with the person you, you know. Um, the next step is a, an assessment process. So the assessment process, um, there's a, a little bit of paperwork that has to happen. You indeed do have to sign you or your, or your POA or your substitute decision maker that um, you are open to an assessment. Um, that somebody will visit with patient and family generally jointly unless we have rare cases where capable patients do not want family. But for the most part, we encourage everybody. There is an eligibility determination, so um, there will be a it will be a fairly extensive assessment. Indeed, there will be outreach to the family physician for an assessment as well, um, and they'll look to determine if the person is indeed eligible. There are some. It's a standardized provincial assessment that we be oh, gone through, and they will indeed. Uh, um, reach out to all other, I mean, if the regional geriatric program is involved, they'll look at that and look at all those things and there'll be an eligibility determination based on if your needs can be met in, um, in the community or if they continue to. And again, everybody has to consent. There is a capacity evaluation step as well. Um, for the most part, it's really obvious. And indeed the consent and capacity board does require um, us to consider everybody capable until such time as they're deemed incapable. So, um, and there are, it's again, pretty complex because there's three vectors within a capacity assessment. There is one for personal care, there's one finance. The only one we'll speak to is eligibility for long-term care, whether the person can appreciate the consequences of going or not going. So there are cases where sometimes people aren't even responsible for personal care, but they do give logical and reasonable answers and we would deem them so they would have to, that person would have to consent. Um, consent is the next step after determining the capacity to evaluation. We will counsel people on their choices and choice is explicit in the legislation. You can choose up to five homes and you can, um, in such case that we've got crisis determination, you can choose an unlimited amount, but it is up to five homes. We will counsel you on some of the attributes in the home. Some people may want a francophone milieu. Somebody else might want it in a certain geography. There are some older homes, um, but indeed the care standards are the same throughout. We'll encourage everybody to visit those homes before making choices. Um, the wait list and admission will also counsel you in that because there are a lot of differences based on where homes are and indeed um, steps on the um, Wait list, it is once again very highly um, regulated in this part. Um, a person with dementia, two individuals may need different pieces. There are some homes that have secure units, meaning that the unit is locked and 
somebody with exit seeking behaviors, people can wander inside an environment and still be fine in many environments. But those with exit seeking behaviors, trying to go outside, they will have limited number of choices depending on the attributes of the home. Um, but again, long-term care, it's really specific. Choice is explicit in the legislation. You can choose. Um, and indeed, there are options. The only piece where that's different is sometimes when people, um, I know there's been people concerned in the community right now with, with some changes, but indeed, within the community, choice is explicit. So I just wanted that to be clear for everybody. I'm not sure if there's uh, any follow-up or any piece that you think I might have missed on that, Grace. No, that's wonderful. I think maybe one frequently asked question, and you might have a good recommendation here, but what, what's your recommended first step for somebody who's looking to um, get into long-term care? Uh, first step for me would be just calling. I mean, call a number, get involved with a care coordinator. If indeed you're already at the step where you're eligible and looking for homes, some people go and look at long-term care. I'd like to go there and, and suppose we'll drive the car there, but that they, they may not qualify or be eligible. I mean, we have some people that um, do not have diagnosis of dementia or people with really early de dementia that are entirely independent. They may not be ready for long-term care at that point. I, I understand everybody wants to prepare, but it's that just in case it doesn't apply necessarily. For the most part, it is people that need help with ADLs. It's people that need help with frequent nursing visits during the day. Um, or again, stresses and, and, and the situational um, piece that every individual is in can be different. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, that's, a, that's a great first step is just reaching out and trying to understand the specific situation you're dealing with and, and what the options might be there. Um, thank you so much, Kevin. So moving back to our spirituality conversation with Jane. Um, wondering if there is any particular spirituality resources that you would recommend. I know you had previously mentioned uh, different kind of tools and tips that, that people can use in their own lives for um, getting in touch with their spirituality. Are there any specific resources that you can, that you can guide um, our attendees to when it comes to getting in touch with their spirituality during difficult times for anybody dealing with dementia, whether it's themselves or their family member? Yes, for sure. And I've provided a list, so I believe it's going to get sent out after, after the seminar today. So you'll have this in writing, so you don't need to, to try to scribble anything down. But there are some great resources. The Henry Nowen Society in Toronto has produced some wonderful resource workbooks for, for people in a caregiving situation that are, are intentionally for, for that and are a good companion along the way for your spiritual life. Uh, other things I've put on the list are some books by Ann Basting, who writes uh, books about creative care and creating better lives for people with dementia. That also it encourages relationship and, and um, Pauline Boss has written about um, loving someone who has dementia, how to find hope while coping with stress and grief. Um, Jolene Bracky has Creating Moments of Joy Along the Alzheimer's Journey, and she also has a website that you can follow. Um, I wanted to draw attention to the webinar that we did through, through the Dementia Society a couple of years ago now with Jan Ramsey. She also has a book that I put on the list called Dignity and Grace, Wisdom for Caregivers and Those Living with Dementia, and we the webinar is on the Dementia Society's website as well still um, through YouTube, so you can access that. Uh, there's another book called No Act of Love is Ever Wasted, The Spirituality of Caring for Persons with Dementia. That's a, a great book as well. And I listed one other website that has um, some great resources called Loving Through Dem Dementia. So I just encourage you to look at that list and find what, what suits you. Yeah, absolutely. And just to confirm again for everybody, we will be sharing that out. But thank you so much, Jane. That's much appreciated. And there's lots there clearly for people to dig into. 
Okay, so we have reached our fourth round um, here and we have two questions remaining. I wanted to just quickly remind everybody if there are questions um, that you would like us to cover as we approach the end of the session, we will have just a few minutes to cover some additional questions um, for the panelists. So again, I would encourage you to enter your questions into the chat box and, and if we have time to cover them, we will. Um, and if not, we will be sharing out some contact information at the end of the session uh, and you can always submit your questions that way as well. Um, but getting back into our final round of questions, starting again with Dr. Frank, um, this again has to do with appetite and dementia. So somebody submitted a question asking uh, if we could explain why somebody with dementia might decline food and rarely drinks liquids. They say, my mother was diagnosed with end-stage dementia. She's losing weight and I believe she is dehydrated. But when offered food, she says she's not hungry, but she will take a cup of tea. She rarely drinks more than a couple sips. She does, however, eat a good dinner in the evening. So there seem to be some mixed behaviors when it comes to, to food and drink here. Um, and wondering if you can offer any insight there. Yes. There's no question that um, over the years, uh, I've seen the pattern that um, cognitive change seems to be associated, well, it can be associated with too much behavior, that is to say, uh, outbursts, um, anger, uh, agitation in some. However, in others, the opposite, um, a becoming very quiet, um, placid. Um, I guess the medical term we sometimes use is apathy, meaning really not generating any initiative uh, or interest. Um, and all of that, uh, can be a result of dementia and Alzheimer's. And as part of that, I believe the apathy, there is less initiative to eat, uh, to prepare food initially and then to eat. Um, and certainly we would like to rule out any other medical condition that might be interfering with appetite. Uh, uh, is there anything in the gastrointestinal system uh, which is changing, abdominal pain or any uh, cause for that? Um, uh, is, there, um, uh, is there any weight loss? And that can be measured, obviously, with a scale perhaps uh, once a week or maybe uh, two or three times a month to see is there a, a medical uh, a cause to the um, decreased intake and therefore a possibly a weight loss associated with that. Uh, could there be an infection? One of the most common causes of health changes in those with dementia is a, a urinary tract or bladder infection. That can affect cognition and even appetite. So, you know, honestly, it's good to uh, um, consider and rule out any medical cause for decreased appetite and then measure weight over time to see if it's actually causing weight loss. Because, of course, if, if there is less intake but there's no change in weight, and the weight is within an acceptable parameter, then perhaps uh, the oral intake is what is, is, what is required. Um, but if there is weight loss or any medical condition, we would like to know that. Um, because ultimately, if someone is comfortable with their uh, intake and there's a caregiver who can provide necessary nutrition, um, and there is general health despite the dementia, uh, it is quite common for those with dementia to take in less. Okay, thank you. That's that's great insight to have, um, that it could be normal for them to, to eat a little bit less. Um, moving on to Misha, uh, somebody wrote in and they're wondering what the best approach is uh, for somebody who will be moving into senior living, and the same applies, I, I believe, for long-term care, um, who doesn't want to go and has a lot of anxiety just talking about it. You know, it's a fairly common situation. I've dealt with that in, in my own family. Um, how can you help the person prepare? Um, and then an additional kind of add-on to their question was how to prepare their belongings for the move with them there. Um, should you allow them to be involved or not? Just generally, what would your advice be around, around moving out of the home and into um, senior living or long-term care? 
Yeah, this it's it's like the other questions. There's no necessary one size fits all. Um, there's some situations when I worked in senior living where um, families would invite the person living with dementia for a meal in the retirement home or senior living home so that they could have a positive experience if they had insight into the fact that they needed to move or that it might be an option. Um, some wouldn't be told that they were moving if they felt that it would stress them out or make them anxious. And they would just come for an activity or a meal um, as if it were a restaurant. And um, so you wanna, you wanna make sure that the story that you're telling the person is connecting with their reality and, and whether or not they understand why they need to, to move and, um, and give little bits of information that um, are palatable to the person. So for some, um, they can be involved in the whole process and they can help pack and they can help pick out their things. For others, it's too overwhelming. And sometimes when you give too much information, um, it can actually create more anxiety and more fear because sometimes what we fear is what we don't know. And there's a lot of questions that we can reassure ourselves when we are living with our full cognition um, just through um, memories and through information. So whatever you offer the person living with dementia and make sure that it's reassuring statements, uh, make sure that um, they know that you're not going to stop visiting them or being part of their lives and that everyone living in senior living um, is just like them and they were they were new um, in their situation once and you know they can make new friends and focus on a lot of the time the recreation program that's offered you can get an activity calendar and show the great things that are coming up or um, talk about things that maybe aren't on the activity calendar that we can we can encourage them to add and, and that can be something you contribute to the home. So really figuring out and connecting to, to the family member that you have and, and, and deciding what piece of that um, is important to them. And if the day of the move, having them part of that uh, process of moving, which for most people can be very overwhelming, moving for anyone is overwhelming. You wanna make sure that you designate certain family members to be part of the actual move piece and there's a there's a family member or two that's just there to reassure the person with dementia so whether you are going there and having a meal or you're attending activity together or spending the whole day just getting to know the environment and then when they go to their room everything is set up with their own familiar um, pieces of furniture and different uh, knickknacks that they liked and you know and an all about me book that has information about who they are so the staff can get to know them. And I think that's that's one of the most important pieces is reassuring the person that the staff here are now an extended piece of, of your family and um, we are gonna make sure that they get to know you and, and love you the way that we do. And uh, so all of those pieces together or um, you know, figuring out what part is making you the most anxious and, and bringing that in and uh, recognizing that that also needs to be addressed as well. Um, really important. Misha, if you would mind, I, I would add to that, there is one opportunity that as well, there's respite in long-term care and that can be the same place. It was closed through a lot of the pandemic, but indeed it has reopened. And there, there could be to familiarize with the environment. And indeed, some people have caregivers or loved ones. There are absences that you can take. So it would, if you start with a respite type of experience, and then indeed, you could follow that up with some day. It, it might be, as you noted, I mean, you don't have to be explicit. This is a long-term care. This is, still, I mean, as transparent and very individual specific. Um, but there are options to, to dipping your toe in more and more. And then it becomes of a normative environment with people that know and like you. Yeah, for sure. That positive emotional experience is, uh, is what you're trying to develop there. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Those positive associations and building that trust is so important throughout the whole process. So thank you, Misha. I appreciate that. And Kevin as well. Um, okay, wonderful. So that does wrap up uh, our Q&A rounds. As I mentioned at the beginning of the session and somewhat throughout the session as well, we will be taking a few questions. We have about 10 minutes left in the session, um, just for everybody's awareness. I do see a couple of questions here in the chat and Q&A boxes. I'm just going to go ahead and, and 
take a look at these um, and try to direct them to the right panelists. So Janet is wondering if aphasia can lead to dementia or whether they're two separate things. Um, I think I'll direct that one to Dr. Frank to start off and uh, by all means, if anybody else uh, wants to contribute as well, go for it. An excellent question. Um, aphasia, uh, A-P-H-A-S-I-A. -A. Aphasia is defined as uh, an abnormality in language, words, uh, reading or writing, uh, both comprehension or, and or expression, uh, the input or the output of language. Now, aphasia itself can be caused by many things. Uh, once again, it can be caused by a stroke. Very sudden onset, a blockage of blood flow or bleeding uh, can cause aphasia. It can, aphasia can also be caused by, uh, the broad term is neurodegeneration, which involves the proteins that I've been talking about tonight. Uh, either the Alzheimer's proteins or the Parkinson's proteins uh, can all uh, accumulate and damage the part of the brain uh, that, that controls language and lead to aphasia. So um, the, the question is, can aphasia lead to dementia? Yes, if, uh, the, if there is neurodegeneration or the proteins accumulating. Because um, these those proteins can indeed start to build up in the language area, causing aphasia first. And then those proteins can continue to build up in other areas of the brain, affecting uh, judgment and personality uh, and memory, uh, which could then lead to the the loss of independence, which is dementia. So if the aphasia is due to a single event like a stroke, uh, it may not lead to dementia, but if there is degeneration, those proteins building up, then it may well eventually lead to dementia. Okay, that's that's great insight there uh, about aphasia. Thank you very much, Dr. Frank. Um, I'm just trying to sort through our questions here because there have been a couple of questions that have come through. Um, I see a question from Debbie. Uh, she's wondering, should I ask my mother if she thinks she has dementia? How self-aware are most people with dementia? So I suppose that's in terms of like self-diagnosis <laughs> um, before they reach out to a medical professional or the Dementia Society. Uh, Dr. Frank, what would you say there? It is very common for those developing more serious memory loss uh, to not realize it. Uh, that is to say, they may be forgetting that they're forgetting. Um, it's it's certainly possible. Uh, so it's it's possible that an individual will not be aware that they are developing uh, dementia. Sometimes if someone is acutely aware of their own memory loss, that might be a reassuring sign that they may not have uh, dementia. So uh, one's own... Um, one's own determination or assessment of themselves may not be accurate. Okay, that's that's good to note. Um, okay, wonderful. So we have um, one last question here from Janet. Um, in London, they have the Alzheimer's Society. She's wondering why there are two societies in Ottawa. So we have the Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, and I will direct that question to Misha, I believe, if you have the insight there. Yeah, so uh, the Dementia Society of Ottawa and Renfrew County uh, formerly was called the Alzheimer's Society. So um, several years ago, we, we rebranded and chose to not um, re-sign on with the Alzheimer's Society Federation so that we could keep the funding local. And so we still receive the same uh, ministry funding uh, from, from the LIN, and we also still do have our own fundraising efforts. And with that, we have the freedom to be able to um, decide what our community wants and needs and um, change our learning sessions um, to reflect what the requests and the needs are in our community. So um, we're able to, to meet all the needs um, in the Ottawa and Renfrew County area based on that. Um, and uh, so we have been in the region for over uh, 40 years. So, um, so we were and and are still um, our local um, charity for supporting people living with dementia. Great, yeah, a little Dementia Society fun fact. <laughs> uh, 
Um, okay, wonderful. So I'm actually going to take one last question because I think this is a great question for Monique. Um, she's wondering if it's best to talk about the diagnosis of dementia, uh, risking the person getting upset or to avoid talking about it. Um, and I believe that might be a question for Misha again. What, what's your recommendation when it comes to talking about diagnosis with a family member? Yeah, so so some people might have have been um, someone who enjoyed and appreciated sharing their feelings and sharing their insight into, you know, their medical conditions their whole life. And maybe some people were very private and didn't want to talk about things. So that's something to respect and understand that some everyone's an individual. And if they were um, someone who is more private, then um, talking about this can be a little bit more tricky. Um, however, um, if the person is noticing and you, they are making comments about things that are changing and they are noticing those changes, um, you can ask some guiding questions. Um, sometimes um, being a little bit on the nose about it and saying, you know, I'm thinking you might have dementia or you're having memory problems can be a very scary way to approach or or start a conversation. So you can go a little lighter and just say, you know, I've um, I've noticed those changes too, or tell me more about the changes that you, you're noticing and and figure out what what maybe would connect with them and open them up to, to having a bigger discussion. So, you know, the, and once the person is diagnosed, we have learning sessions here that they can come to as well um, with you as a family, and we can all have those communication um, pieces together. Um, but I think it's just um, taking one step at a time, um, making sure that, that you're not going too heavy too fast, because you certainly want to remain in their trust circle and make sure that the that you're not creating those those negative um, reactions around any sort of um, assessment piece too, because we want to make sure that we we can still continue to go back and uh, and uh, not make a doctor's office uh, a scary place too. Yeah, that's right. Back to all those positive associations that you want to build. Okay, well, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to all of our experts panelists who have been with us tonight, answering these questions and sharing their insight. Um, it's been so valuable. I know I've learned a lot. I hope that everybody who's listening has as well. Um, we wanted to run a brief poll. I believe Herman is uh, is setting that up right now. So for everybody who's on the call, you will see a quick poll with a question appear um, on the screen. If you don't mind taking a quick read through those questions, um, answering and submitting, just so that we can understand a little bit more about your experience in today's session, that would be so appreciated. Um, and while you do that, I'm going to go through just uh, a couple of pieces of information as we close out this evening. Um, so, of course, thank you all so much for, for tuning in and being a part of this event with the Dementia Society. And thanks again to our panelists. Um, this webinar will be available. I saw Monique's question about um, maybe coming in a little bit late. That's totally fine. The entire session has been recorded and it will be available on demand on our YouTube channel. Um, you can go ahead and, and search the Dementia Society of Ottawa on YouTube, or you can find the YouTube channel through our website as well. Uh, and it should be available on there shortly. And for more information on the educations, programs, and support that are offered by the Dementia Society, um, all of that information is available on our website. It's a great place. It's been recently revamped, and there's a, a ton of resources, um, information, other events like this that are going on and, and being held by the Dementia Society. Um, so I would definitely recommend that you check out uh, DementiaHelp.ca. So that's Dementia H E L P. Ca. If you prefer to contact the Dementia Society another way, there's also um, a phone number that's available um, on our website, or you can email us. It's info at dsorc.org. If you had a question that you didn't get a chance to submit uh, or didn't get answered in this session and you would really like an answer to, um, I would absolutely recommend that you send it to that email address and we will do our best to direct your question to uh, the right person and, and get that answered and get you the resources that you need moving forward. Um, and we also have a weekly email newsletter that we would really recommend that you sign up for as well if you would like more resources uh, around dementia and information about events like this that are being held by the Dementia Society. Um, and I'm going to briefly hand it back to Herman for some closing remarks and just want to say thank you again to our panelists. Yes, yeah, so, well, thank you everyone for the 
for those answers. Uh, I know the community values uh, all the answers and it's uh, very practical and information that we need at this point through the journey of dementia. So I also like to thank everyone to, uh, for participating today. Uh, and uh, yeah, so maybe, I don't know if there are any final remarks, any final message from the, from the, the panelists before we wrap up. Thank you to all. Yeah, thanks very much for the opportunity to speak to you today. Yes, thank you to everyone. I've learned a lot. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening, everyone. Bye now. Thanks again, everyone. Good night. Good night.